Chapter 32, Postmortem. It was a nightmare, Grandad. He, he just sat there laughing at me. Grandad tuts as we drive past the chip shop. I'm sorry, I say. I can tell you're mad at me for losing. Losing? No, I'm not mad at you for losing. We all lose. We all have to play. That's how we get better. No, I'm annoyed that you stormed out, that you are going back to your old ways. I couldn't help but Grandad, I say. He was so irritating. Then we will address this says Grandad. Just give me time to think. I blow out my cheeks. Grandad stares ahead. He's annoyed with me, but I'm glad that he's back to picking me up from school again. Although after losing my temper, I feel like the walk home might have helped me calm down. I've been thinking about it all afternoon. Rich's huge grin, my hothead. I didn't even notice I'd run past Mr. Keats on the way out. That afternoon, our class were learning about Arch Archimedes' principle in science. Mr. Groves filled a bucket with water and put something in it, but I was too busy watching the classroom door thinking Rich would have snitched to Mr. Keats and I'd get sent to the isolation room. I hope not because I was tired of getting sent there. Jake thought smashing all the pieces over the board was funny, but after mum and dad were so pleased I was back with granddad. I didn't want to disappoint them by getting into trouble at school again. The car stops at a traffic light. Grandad turns to me. Look, he says, I can tell you are upset, but this is a good thing. Is it? I say, still disappointed with myself. Of course, it shows you care, but unfortunately, it shows you also forgot one of my rules. To be honest, Grandad, I was so mad, I think I forgot them all. Yes, Grandad chuckles. I am thinking you did. He lifts his hand. I screw my eyes and wait for the rap of his knuckles, but all I feel is his hand ruffling my hair. I smile. I forgot number eight, didn't I, Grandad? Never let your opponent see you are upset. Yes. Grandad nods as we pull away from the lights, but we can remedy that. For now, we should concentrate on number two, that you lose to get better. So tell me about the game, the moves you both made. I can't remember much. All I know is that I was white, so I couldn't use the silicon defence, even if I could have remembered it. Just try, says Grandad. Start with the first move. That is always the best place. I rest my head against the seat and try to remember the start of the game. I tell Grandad the moves Rich made and the moves I made too. Grandad makes an mmm sound and stares at the road, like he's moving the chess pieces around in his head. I tell him the next 10 moves and then pause. Grandad looks across at me. And what happened next? He asks. That's when I got up and did it. That's when I swiped the pieces off the board. No, before that, you've missed lots out. Go back to the beginning. You moved a pawn to E4. Did he move a pawn to C5? Then a pawn to D6? Um, I'm not sure, but yes, I think so. Just think. He says, it's important. Did he take your pawn at d4 and then you took his pawn? Um, yes. Ah, then he is playing the same game as your friend. Jake? He doesn't, no, not him. Your friend, Bobby Fisher. The game was called Night of the Nadov. He played it in Santa Monica in 1966. Grandad, I say, shaking my head. You're really confusing me. All I know is that I lost and the game hardly lasted 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Grandad says as we turn into the square. 10 minutes is good against the Nadorf variation. No, it's not good against anything, Grandad. I say, turning to him. I heard Rich tell the others that I should stick to snakes and ladders. It is okay, says Grandad. Doesn't worry, I told you. We all have to lose to get better. He stops the car outside his house. When I was your age, I lost my first game to an eight-year-old boy from Pankow, a suburb in East Berlin where I lived. He didn't even seem to look at the board and his hands moved as quickly as a Venus flytrap, just like this rich. So we all lose. Grandad gives me a kind smile, the same type of smile Grandma gave when I dropped an ice cream in the park. It's okay, Grandad, I say dejectedly, looking into the footwell. I know you're only trying to make me feel better, but I'm as rubbish at chess as I am at everything else. 
I pick up my bag. No, this isn't the case, says Grandad. I would not just say things for no reason. And Felix, one more thing. He puts his hand on my bag. I wait for him to say something, but he just looks for me at me for a long time. What is it, Grandad? I ask. We all learn from our mistakes, he says slowly. I know, Grandad, you just said. Yes, but not just Chess. I mean, what happened that Sunday when you thought I was a spy? I know, Grandad, I repeat, and it was a mistake and I did say I was sorry. Yes, you did, but I think I should say sorry too. It's okay, Grandad, you don't have to. I'm just glad we're playing chess again. Me too, but I need to tell you something if we're going to keep playing. We cannot have suspicions about each other. We must have trust if we are to continue. But I do trust you, Grandad. I wait for Grandad to say something else but he just stares ahead like he's a world away. I reach for the door handle. Just sit still a while, says Grandad, glancing round the square. It is best I tell you here. Grandad watches Mrs Hardy cleaning her windows, then turns his head and watches a man outside number 50, 25 strap a little girl into a pushchair. What's wrong, Grandad? I ask. What do you need to tell me? Why I keep the curtains closed, why I don't like the phone, and why you tear up pieces of paper. Yes, that too. Grandad takes one more look around the square, then leans closer to me. Felix, he whispers. It is true, my country was full of spies. So you are, Grandad's words take my breath away. No, no, I was not one of them. But there were so many that no one in my country trusted each other during the Cold War after they built the wall, when the east was split from the west, like I told you. My country had a secret police, a police that, that watched everyone all the time. It was called the Stasi, I whisper. Yes, Grandad nods. How did you know? Jake told me. He looked it up. Grandad makes a, an mmm sound, like he might have forgiven me, but not Jake. As I was saying, my country was full of spies. You could not trust your neighbour. You could not trust the owner of the corner shop. Sometimes you could not trust your own family. Every shop, every office, every room could have a listening device. So it really was like in Pawn Sacrifice, I say, when Bobby Fisher thought his room and the telephone were bulked. Grandad waits for the man with the gear in the pushchair to pass us. Yes, Grandad checks his rear view mirror. It was just like that. His voice was so low, I can hardly hear him. They had listening devices everywhere. Your great-grandfather, great-grandmother and I, we could not even talk in our own home. And when we went out, we would be followed. Guards stood in towers and aimed guns down onto the street. So we stayed in all the time. If we wanted to say something important, we would write it down on a piece of paper. And after we'd read it, we tore the paper into tiny pieces so the spies could never know what we had written. And we kept our curtains closed all the time, just in case they were watching from across the street. It was always dark, but at least if we couldn't see out, then they couldn't see in. And of course, we couldn't escape because they had built the Berlin Wall. The wall that split the east from the west that I told you about. I tried to think of something to say. But Grandad's life sounds so bad, it's like a film. I wonder if it can really all be true. But from the serious look on his face, I can tell there's no way he has made the story up. I stare out of the window. Sometimes I feel like the square is closing in on me, that everyone knows what I'm doing. But that's really only Mrs Flower when she snitches on me for going into her garden to get tennis balls. Mum says she knows everyone's business. But what must it be like to have thousands of Mrs Flowers going through your rubbish, listening to every word that you say? Even that doesn't feel anything like as bad as what Grandad had when he was growing up. They had uniforms. They had guns. I look across at Grandad. He stares ahead. I've said I'm sorry twice, but now I want to say it a million times. Grandad, it is okay. He takes the keys out of the ignition. 
It was a long time ago. We do not have to talk about it any more. But, but nothing, says Grandad. We have said all we need. I think we should go inside now. And besides, I have a plan. I will show you after tea. For the Stassi, are they still around? Are they still in the towers, pointing their guns down at the wall? At all the people scrambling over the barbed wire? No, thankfully not. So what's the plan for? A smile creeps across Grandad's face. To beat this rich, of course.